Jones and corporations. Good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful day today. So I'm here to talk to you about what's happening on the planet. Uh, give you some really, really bad news, and then to tell you our story uh, about what we have done to deal with all that bad news. Um, here are some of the things that we should know about. Why bats are dying by the millions, why bees are dying by the billions, why bird population is plunging, ocean acidification, melting ice caps, deforestation, Dangers of natural gas fracking, tar sands pollution, GMOs, Monsantos, um, potential food shortages because of drought, soil depletion, and the plunge in wildlife. Uh, that's half the list. Okay, I could go on and on. Um, and this is what they're telling us. This is what the corporate media is telling us. Who got murdered? Lindsay Lohan. Who said what? That doesn't matter. Kane West and Kim Kardashian. Car chases. Kanye West. Kanye. Sorry. You know about that. Uh, Justin Bieber, who's, who's getting divorced? The first lady's workout routine, sex scandals, the stock report, who's gay, how many cars are selling, who got arrested. That's half that list. So we're not getting the information that we need from the corporate media. And there's a lot of other places to get it on the internet. We've got some uh, magazines back yet there, uh, one of which is called Acres USA, the voice uh, for ecological agriculture. has a lot of stuff that's applicable to home landscapes, too. Um, so why, why do we need to transition to a sustainable future? Why bother? Uh, won't our coin-operated political and economic leaders fix our problem? Surely they can see that humans have severely damaged the planet. They know enough about sustainable living to guide us through the rap rapid transition that's necessary to avoid trouble, don't they? And besides, what's the hurry? We have plenty of time to make changes in our lives to adapt to rapidly changing conditions on Earth. Here's your, uh, it should work as a clicker. Okay. It's got Good. forward and back there. Is it? Okay. Well, let's look at where we are today. Um, what are the problems that you see are facing us? What are your concerns for the future? Tell you the first thing that comes into your head, anyone. Climate change. Climate change, that's on the top of the list nowadays, isn't it? Wealth inequality. Pardon? Wealth inequality. Mm-hmm. That's serious, too. Water availability. Okay. Water. Right, right. Uh, that is probably the root cause of all our problems, is our overpopulation of the planet. Anybody else? Well, I've got a few notes here on, on those and a few other things. Fossil fuel depletion. Worldwide, we use globally 93 million barrels of oil per year. Oh, wait. I, I said per year. That's per day. 93 million barrels of oil per day and the toxics that we dump into the atmosphere in burning that. Then there's the climate disruption associated with that. Some people don't believe that we have a serious climate problem, but how could we not by dumping all that carbon into the atmosphere? Has anyone uh, noticed the floods, the droughts, the fires, the tropical diseases moving north, more violent and frequent storms, the heat? 2015 was the hottest year by far ever recorded in the last 11 out of 12 years also were the hottest years, consecutively getting hotter. The human overpopulation, as uh, Mike said, 40% uh, over uh, sustainability. Uh, I heard that we need one and a half planets in order to sustain what we have already. We are living on the capital 
the natural capital of this planet. We've long ago used up the interest, and now we're, we're using the capital. And how long is that going to last? We're into overshoot. William Catton wrote, wrote a book by that title, Overshoot. Uh, we're adding 228,000 people a day to the planet. 80 million people every year. Back in 1970, there was 3.7 billion people on the planet. Today, there are 7.4. We've doubled the population of the planet. Does anybody see a problem here? The species extinctions. We're into the sixth great extinction in the history of the planet. The sixth great extinction. We're losing over 100 species a day. And when they're gone, they're gone forever. This isn't the uh, death of a species. This is the end of birth. It's happening now. This is reality. There we go. Check this uh, graph. We live on a water planet. 70% of our, our planet is water. Here's cod in uh, the uh, Atlantic cod stocks, east coast of New Newfoundland. Uh, once, I forgot my point. Uh, once the... Uh, There's a laser on that. There's a laser right on Oh, there is. In the middle? Nope. One that looks like an asterisk. Ah, how convenient. <laughs> so once people figured out uh, how through, through uh, technology to locate these fish and harvest them, you can see that the population crashed. I mean, it just didn't decline. It crashed. And look where it is today. It's still down there. I mean... This is serious stuff. Uh, you won't find this on the, on the corporate media. You've got to look for these things. All right, so being on a water planet, the, the oceans are dying. 20% of the corals on the planet are gone. 90% of the large fish have been fished out of the ocean. Dolphins are washing up on beaches at four to five times the background rate. There are dead zones at the estuaries of the rivers filled with toxic chemicals from agriculture and industry and even our own toilets. Uh, toilet cleaners, there are pharmaceuticals in the water. The, the, it's predicted that the plastic in the ocean by 2050, the weight of the plastic that is in the ocean will equal the weight of the fish. How many people know, know most of this stuff? Okay, well, that's great. Uh, but there's, there's more. <laughs> there's Fukushima. Who's talking about Fukushima? When's the last time you read about the fact that three nuclear reactors have melted down and they don't know where the cores are and they don't know how to fix it. There's acidification in the increasing rise of ocean temperatures. Carbon dioxide in the air, carbonic acid in the ocean. 70% of our oxygen comes from marine plants. We need to breathe. And they're dying. They're dying because of ocean acidification and temperature rise. There's pollution, toxic waste. Thousands of untested chemicals are in our lives and in our bodies. The Gulf of Mexico is a disaster that will continue for decades, if not longer. There was the California uh, methane gusher at the Porter Ranch. Incredible amounts of methane into the atmosphere. And methane is 40 times more potent a, a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. 
the American chestnut back in the early 19... Hundreds was extinguished because of the chestnut blight, a foreign disease that came into the country. And in five, ten years, the, the entire four billion chestnut trees died. Uh, and it impoverished uh, Appalachia. There's desertification of our agricultural land. Our population increases and our farmland decreases. Is there a problem here? The tragedy of industrial agriculture. There's a book on the table back there with some other stuff if you want to look at it afterwards. Um, there's, we're, we're getting a fatal harvest. Steve Tewald knows about all that. He runs a... Uh, what is it called? <laughs> Green Earth Institute, yes. Um, there's GMOs. Water pollution and dead zones, I mentioned that, but 50% of the soil in this country is gone due to industrial agriculture, washed away by water and air. Erosion. Our soil has turned to dirt because of agrochemicals, uh, pesticides, insecticides, fertilizers, and the life of the soil is, is nearly gone. This is the great acceleration, folks. Uh, if you can look at this, these graphs, and you can Google the, the Great Acceleration on, uh, on your computer and see these graphs larger. But there is world population, uh, urban population, primary energy use, fertilizer consumption, stratospheric ozone, uh, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, ocean acidification, and the list goes on and on. And where are these graphs all going? They're going that way because of cheap energy, because of fossil fuels. When uh, a population will rise to meet the available food supply, and we have increased the food supply so far with fossil fuels that the population has just gone up. Fossil fuels, population, everything else. The list of damages goes on and on, and when a complete awareness sinks in, it's damn depressing and getting worse. I've devoted an entire chapter in the book I'm writing as a wake-up call for action. It's titled The Dark Side and the Age of Consequences. Uh, the book is mainly positive. I want to keep this negative information separate from the message that I'm about to tell you. It describes all the things we just talked about and more, and there is a seemingly endless list of assaults uh, that are happening. And if you sense some anger in me about this, you're paying attention. I've been talking about this stuff for 35 years now, and mostly you get a thousand-yard stare. So we need to bring this up. We need to talk about this frequently. The point is we've entered some very troubled waters and we're facing a global megastorm of epic proportions. These problems and predicaments together seem overwhelming and one is tempted to say, I can't deal with this. I give up. This is not happening. What can I do? The only choice left is to adapt and there will be no special dispensation for the consequences if we fail. We are all on this planet together. There's no other planet to go to. So as a favorite uncle of mine used to say, that's just the facts, Jack. <laughs> but I'm not here to go on about the mess humans have created on the planet. I want to tell you about the solutions and answers we've discovered over 35 years in our experiences with sustainable living. When I was here last for a talk on sustainable, sustainability, somebody asked, what can I do? Where do I start? So I volunteered today to talk and to plant some seeds, some seeds of inspiration, and to answer those questions. <coughs> Oops. 
If you nurture and cultivate the seeds I will give you today, they will yield a harvest of peace, natural prosperity, and abundance. Guaranteed. The light and warmth that may germinate these seeds is a story, the story I'm about to tell you. The soil in which to grow these seeds needs to come from you. That fertile and nourishing soil is courage. Courage to face an <clears throat> uncertain future with strength and resilience. And I'm here to help you uncover that courage and to reassure you that the jump to sustainability is the safest way forward for you, our families, and for all generations to follow. Our quality of life and that of our children and grandchildren are at stake now, and we need to hit the restart button. And soon, before the natural systems that support our lives crash. It's like the cod graph. If 10% of our population becomes aware of the crises that threaten us, I believe there can be a tipping point of renewal. We must now work tirelessly to reach that tipping point. So where should anyone start? I think Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz had it right. What did she say? Anyone? What was her most famous line? That's it. <laughs> there is no place like home. That's the place to start. Now this is Vicki, you've met her already. We became aware about 35 years ago that humans were, and increasingly are, on a very fast track to destroying life on our only planet. My schooling as a landscape architect and her master's degree in environmental education told us we needed to define a different path. So, we designed built and evolved a home, landscape, and lifestyle that would demonstrate that living sustainably did not include freezing in the dark while eating dried bean spouts. <laughs> we started out with a model, a scale model, found a lot, dug a hole, built a home and office, and ended up 25 years later with a sustainable landscape and home. We also ended up demonstrating a whole lot more than sustainability. We demonstrated a, a really rewarding and enriching quality of life. We did this to try to ensure a high quality of life for our grandchildren in the hope that others would follow a parallel path. Few have found that path, perhaps because they simply could not see it, or they were misled to follow another path leading only to short-term economic gains. Many got lost in a love affair with cheap energy. Many more were also blinded by what I think was a loss of ecological literacy, a term that uh, David Orr in Oberlin College originated. That's another in chapter in the book I'm writing, Ecological Literacy, but that's the subject of a different talk. Anyway, has anyone seen the PBS specials by Wayne Dyer? Nobody. Pardon? Uh, the title of the talks, um, there were several. Uh, these, something, the... Uh, Spirit of Intention or something like that. But anyhow, he was very well known on, on PBS giving talks on uh, spirituality and, uh, and individual improvement. And one of the things that he said was, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Well, 
We began our journey 40 years ago by changing the way we looked at the natural world. Our land at home, our homeland. Since then, it's been a fascinating and rewarding journey. The most important and pivotal thing in our transition to a sustainable living was making a choice to cooperate with and nurture the natural systems that give us life. We then abandoned the failed paradigm of domination and control of the natural world. Now something's bare repeating. The most important and pivotal thing in our transition to sustainable living was making a simple choice <coughs> to cooperate with and nurture the natural force with uh, and nurture the natural forces and systems that give us life. We then ab abandoned the failed paradigm of domination and control of the natural world. That change in perspective, that paradigm shift, change of heart, attitude, adjustment, ah, lost my place here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and simple choice fundamentally changed and enriched our lives, as you'll see. May apple, it's a, got an edible fruit. It's really very tasty. And here is our uh, yard. The, we call it Circle Garden Farm. So our objectives were to conserve as much as possible non-renewable fossil energy and other finite resources. They're saying that uh, by 2050, in order to avoid a climate collapse, catastrophe, which is beginning now, we need to reduce fossil fuel consumption by 80%. 80%. So maybe no more trips to Disneyland, I mean, if we care. We definitely have enough um, fuel or fossil fuels in the ground that's left, where it's about half of it, and it's the low-quality stuff. It's the dregs, the sludge. There's enough left in the ground to totally fry the planet. That's for sure. So we have to stop using it. The Arctic is already 13 degrees above normal and the ice is rapidly melting rapidly melting and there's a there's a feedback loop there that is very very scary because as the ice melts less sunlight is reflected this is called albedo effect so less less ice more sunlight reaches the seawater the seawater warms more ice melts. As the ice melts, more seawater warms. So it's a self-reinforcing loop. And once it gets going, there's no stopping it. And they're saying now that it's going. We also wanted to cultivate only useful plants as much as possible. So uh, we all see a lot of those. Uh, a lot of food. A lot of food. This is our uh, trellis for hardy kiwis. And there is lettuce, uh, onions, um, garlic, uh, what is this? Kale, uh, a whole list of things. We also wanted to increase plant biodiversity to counter widespread diversity loss. Uh, honeybees are disappearing, most likely due to neonicotinoid pesticides and other factors. Uh, the monarchs are recovering this last year, um, but they were down like 80, 90 percent the year before that. So simply planting butterfly weeds and uh, milkweeds. And we wanted to increase and enhance the educational potential of the land 
by planting a diversity of plants. In order to do that, it was essential to grow everything organically without toxic man-made chemicals. Roundup use worldwide was 650,000 tons in 2011. Farmers and homeowners are using this stuff. It was just recently declared a probable carcinogen. Now, if terrorists came over here and spread all that stuff on our farmland and in our front yards and backyards, what do you think would happen? There would be a national mobilization of uh, the military to kill the bastards. But there's nothing happening. Monsanto continues to sell this toxic chemical. But they are now under investigation by the FBI for lying, the Exxon is, about, for lying about uh, um, global warming. They did a study on that, came out that, hey, there's some serious effects, but they kept it real quiet. This is back in 1970. So if they had shared that information, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in today. So... We found them, the weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> they were right down the street in the hardware store all the time. About a quarter mile away from our home, of all places. There's some books back there on the table if you want to take a look at them. And what we wanted to do is to increase our, even though we had a fairly... Uh, high level of ecological literacy, we wanted to increase our level of, of knowledge about the natural world. So we, uh, we have hundreds of books on, on sustainability, on plants, on... Um, this is Guy on Atlas of Plant Management, uh, Water Supply, somebody mentioned that. And then this book is back there, Fatal Harvest. This is an incredible book. If you can find a copy of this, you know, get it. It's a big book. Uh, and it explains in great detail um, the toxicity of our food supply. <coughs> and one of our last objectives was to create a home and landscape of intense natural beauty. As a landscape architect, that was really important to me. That was and still is a very important goal. And later on, other objectives would evolve as we learned more about sustainability, CO2 emissions, and climate disruption. We learned to sequester carbon at home, increase soil, and increase soil biodiversity, and those two are closely related. We decided on a natural systems, low technology approach to design. Our home and landscape plan included a New England salt box home modified for more efficient passive solar heating and cooling. We then designed a productive no lawn landscape where we could grow much of our own organic food and vastly increase the health of our land at home. When we built the home in 1980, that was 36 years ago, so we were a little bit ahead of the curve. We used passive solar design principles and facets of permaculture. Ten years after we moved in, somebody came and said, hey, this is a great permaculture landscape. And I said, what's permaculture? <laughs> we were doing it before we knew we were doing it. So here's an early sketch. We took advantage of the salt boxes uh, low profile to the north to allow winter winds to flow up and over the house rather than to infiltrate the house. We kept the function of a centrally located chimney and fireplace, 
a thermal mass or thermal flywheel and added a water circulating fireplace grate in an air circulating fire, firebox to harvest and distribute the heat from the fire throughout the home. In addition to passive solar design, heat comes from a hot water baseboard heating system connected to the fireplace. So most of the time we're using current sunlight rather than ancient sunlight. Ancient sunlight being fossil fuels, current sunlight, firewood. There are three heating zones with automatic setback thermostats and a backup gas boiler. The fireplace is about 55 to 60 percent efficient. A typical outside wall chimney and fireplace is anywhere from minus 15 to plus 5 percent efficient if there's no heat exchange device within it. So the fireplace centrally located, sun is uh, high in the sky in the winter time and we uh, plan the upper roof surface, pardon? This is winter. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. You're right. The sun is low in the sky in the winter time. Uh, we designed the upper um, roof surface at 52 degrees for maximum efficiency for solar collectors, but we never installed them because we didn't ever win the lottery. Pardon? Yes, it is. We installed an interior, or included an interior brick wall that also functions as a thermal mass to re retain the heat in the winter and harvest the coolness of the evenings in the summer. And we tied this in with the windows, which you'll see in a second. We use casement windows rather than double hung. So when we open that window up, we can catch a breeze going past the house and double the velocity of the breeze coming into the house. The windows are also located on the east and west side so that the breeze could flow through easily. We could cool, open the windows, cool the house down very quickly in the evening, and it would stay cool for several days after we close up the windows and the temperature goes up to 90 degrees without air conditioning. No air conditioning. Well, we did install that after about 15 years because as we were getting older and working outside every day, we wanted to come home to a really cool house. <laughs> so that doubles the wind velocity. The windows were opposite. And then there was overhangs in the summertime. Oh, come on. In the summertime, the... The sun is high in the sky, so very little sunlight gets into the windows. In the wintertime, the sun is low in the sky, right there, <laughs> and we get full sunlight coming into the house to heat the house through the windows, also called solar apertures, if you want to be technical. <coughs> so there's, let's see... And we planted deciduous shade trees and evergreen windbreak trees as a growing investment. No pun intended. Think about that for a minute. Even the rate of return on a shade or a windbreak tree planting increases every year as the tree grows. What other investment can you make that the rate of return increases every year. It's a good investment. Uh, the savings in fuel use increase each year as the trees grow, and there are three facets of shade trees. Oh, I forgot my umbrella. One of them is, is that a tree acts as an umbrella. I mean, it just blocks the sun. And that's good, but there's more to it. A tree also transpires. It sweats, basically. And a tree this size 
will transpire maybe 40 gallons of water a day. And when that water evaporates, it cools the environment around the house and within the trees. So that the, the uh, temperature underneath the shade trees is 3 to 8 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than it is out in the yard in the sunlight. And that, that's two facets of it. The, the transpiration, the physical shade, and then there's photosynthesis. When the sunlight hits a roof surface, like up there, uh, that light energy turns to heat energy, and it wants to get through your insulation and make your house warm. When it hits a green leaf, the light energy turns to matter through photosynthesis. It's magic. The heat's gone. And it turns into leaves, branches, trunks, roots, and it's stored as potential energy. So the energy's gone. Here, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, maybe I missed it already. There was a graph. No, here it is. So here's the, we also included a, uh, uh, an ice house roof. We used extra, extra insulation to increase the thermal efficiency, R16 two by six walls and R30 in the roof, and these were common values today, but were considered high in 1980. And then we used a low-tech ice house roof design for passive cooling. No fans, no mechanical systems, no electricity. Works by convection. And the, te the technique was used in old-time ice houses before mechanical refrigeration was possible. Ice was harvested out of ponds and and uh, rivers and lakes in big blocks, okay? And they were stacked in a, in a barn, in an ice house, covered with straw and sawdust, and that ice would stay ice throughout the next summer. Um, pretty simple. And this really became clear to me. Um, one time at my folks' farm, we went out on the 4th of July, a whole group of us, my father, seeing the potential um, labor force that was there, said, hey, um, would you guys go over there and, and get that big pile of rotted manure that's next to the concrete wall in the, in the corner and spread it in the garden? I said, yeah, okay, we'll do it. So we did it. We were digging and digging and digging and digging. We came upon a big pocket of snow <laughs> in the middle of this decomposed uh, manure. So the farmer had shoved all this stuff up against the wall uh, and left it there and it had stayed frozen through the 4th of July. And we had a snowball fight. <laughs> it was really cool. It was really cold actually. So we had windows on the east, south, and west sides provide that passive solar gain. Um, with no active system. Carefully sized roof overhangs we talked about. And then in summer, the upper roof surface I had mentioned is angled at 52 degrees and we hadn't ever installed the, the collectors up there. But one of the things, we did a lot, of, I did a lot of research when I, before I designed this house and, and landscape. And one of the things that I came across was this chart. Uh, west gain, heat gain per west window uh, in BTUs per hour. Single glass, double glass, triple glass, single heat absorbing glass, single full length drapery, drapery, single Venetian blinds, single roller shades, single louvered screens, tree shade. Hmm. So we planted shade trees. We have an office at home with no travel time and no travel expense. It is heated with a small wood stove and the solar gain from a large sliding glass door. Fuel wood and solar energy is collected locally, often at the curbside with the wood. Uh, 
Our home and office is very energy efficient and it costs only about 5% more to build than typical construction of the late 70s. Careful design instead of high-tech hardware was our key to conserving fossil fuels. As technology evolves and our incomes permit, we can still add high-tech features to it. The gas meter, it's an affirmation. It really is. Two months after we moved in, the gas company came to check the gas meter to see if it was broken. <laughs> they figured our gas use was far too low for the size of the home we built. They came out again to check a month later. Then they came out one last time replaced the meter and left scratching their heads. We knew our design was successful when that happened. If you want to save 50% and more on your heating and cooling bills and have a dramatic impact on lessening climate disruption, research, thoughtful design, a good imagination, and Mother Nature are your biggest allies. Sustainability is not rocket science. It is just common or uncommon sense. Ecological literacy informed choices and an urgent desire to leave a habitable planet for our grandchildren. The landscape, we have over time evolved a landscape that is powered by a process and not by inputs alone. The process is called permaculture. Google it and search YouTube for a wealth of information on this life enhancing design strategy. We simply added aesthetic beauty to the functional beauty of this practical approach to living within natural limits. The identity and health of our land, oh, there's the garden queen, <laughs> is determined by the tasks we don't perform as well as by the tasks we do perform. We don't mow. We have no lawn. In fact, there was an article in the local paper about us after we moved in, and the headline was, Couple in Downers Grove has no lawn. <laughs> we don't use toxic chemicals that would pollute our soil, water, and air. We don't rototill and burn up the humus in the soil through oxidation. We don't rake leaves. Leaves are fertilizer. And I've never seen a chipmunk or a squirrel raking leaves and putting little bags out on the street. <laughs> we don't trim hedges. We don't edge a lawn. And by the way, this is uh, dill. <laughs> I'm over 70. I got an excuse. <laughs> And once you have dill, you probably have it forever, but it's easy to pull and it's not really a problem. But who needs fireworks on the 4th of July if you've got dill plants in your yard? We don't own, maintain, and fuel the machines needed to do these things. This is uh, chai blossom vinegar. Very, very easy to make. The day's harvest of, of pole beans, sweet potatoes, apple service berries. This is one of the plants that I use to introduce my clients to uh, edible plants. It's a very beautiful ornamental plant and the berry is really good. It tastes like an apple. It's about the size of a blueberry, a little bit seedy but really good. And then we've got 
Kiwis, hardy kiwis, hardy to minus 25 degrees. If it gets colder, it dies down to the ground, it never has. Uh, but we got like 35 or 40 pounds of uh, little kiwis off of this plant one year. And they're also called grape kiwis. Uh, you don't peel them, you just eat them like grapes. They taste really good, they're very high in vitamin A and C. And um, they're called in the catalogs a vigorous plant. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so we have to beat it back every year, but it's worth it. There are collateral benefits to all this. In the garden, exercise. There's nothing wrong with exercise. You may even want to cancel your gym membership. Then there's health care. Growing your food at home. This is the only photo that isn't of our site. And then as a result of the health care, you know, food is, is health care. Medicine is sick care. And that's what we thoroughly believe in. We also believe, we also think of ourselves as, as part of the uh, native fauna, uh, as part of, a, of an ecosystem uh, that we are taking care of rather than exploiting. Oops, I missed one, didn't I? No, I didn't. All right, there's... Um, We've in drastically in increased biodiversity. There's maybe 30 or 40 different kinds of fungi on our site. Since we don't use chemicals, we don't kill the soil organisms, and fungi are one of the organisms. I'm hoping to learn which ones are edible, because I love mushrooms. There's a lot of different ones there. And these plants, all our plants, do one very important thing, and they exhale oxygen. What else matters if you can't breathe? We also, um, they also sequester carbon, and they, they create and fertilize soil naturally without depleting, poisoning, or eroding our healthy soil. Also, one of the fringe benefits is that we enjoy the peace, prosperity, and enriching experiences of being responsible members of our larger land community. So I'm going to tell you three stories. One about the tomato hornworm. I was out one day uh, taking pictures, and I ran across the tomato hornworm on a tomato plant. <laughs> And I notice, hey, there's, there's eggs on its back. And this is from a parasitic wasp, I believe. So as I'm sitting there, and I took this picture, right after I took the picture, a, a yellow jacket came up, plucked one of the eggs off of the back of this hornworm, and flew away. And then it came back again and did it again. And it, would, it happened so fast, I couldn't get a picture of it. But the... Hornworms parasitized by the uh, parasitic wasp in the yellow jacket is taking the eggs away. So really, it was cool. It was just a really cool experience. And this is, this is um, one of the principles of permaculture, observe and interact. Uh, these tomato hornworms do some damage, but... This is what they turn into. This absolutely fabulous moth, which is the size of a hummingbird, and you can mistake it for a hummingbird in your garden, unless you're looking closely, because it's, it's doing this. It's got a very long proboscis that goes down into the, the flowers, and it's absolutely beautiful. So if you're thinking of uh, 
killing all your hornworms. Think again, maybe. And then, oops, there's the hummingbirds. And they fly so fast I wasn't able to get a picture of them. We've got a pair of them in our yard. And they've been there for three, four, five years. And they come back every year, I guess, or new ones come in. But I was standing there one day on a very warm summer evening when uh, uh, it was quite dry and I was just standing there kind of watering. And a hummingbird flew up and started flying around right in front of me. I could have almost reached out and touched it. And it was sipping water droplets off of the plants that I had just watered. I was standing very still, just kind of enjoying the evening, exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide with the plants. And uh, it was really a cool experience. It really was. And then another time, I was in another part of the garden with my hand up on a kind of a, a trellis structure, holding the hose, and then I saw this hummingbird moving around again, and I just stayed really still. And it came and sat right underneath my hand on the trellis, just like that. So uh, my whole body started smiling. <laughs> that was really cool. Really, really cool. And fun, one of the side effects of, oh, wait a minute, here's the, the screech owl. This is the third story. Um, one day we were out, and I'd, I'd heard this uh, sound, and it was, and it was a screech owl. I saw it up on a limb about 18 feet up, and it lived with us for about three summers straight. It would come back and sit on that same limb. And I showed it to a neighborhood kid, and a few days later, his, all his friends, he brought all his friends over. He says, Mr. Nowicki, can we show him the screech owl? <laughs> so we pointed him out, and the kids there are going, oh, it's cool. And then it just went, oh, look at us. <laughs> Another time I was out, um, and I heard this call of the screech owl, so I repeated it. And a screech owl flew up and sat on a branch right near me. I said, holy cow. And this is after the one that was there for three years was killed by a car. And, and then another one had come in. So I, I saw this, and, and it flew up and sat on a branch. So I decided, hey, I'll talk to it. So I went, just to see what it would do. And another one came up and sat on the fence and was looking at me, and they're both going. <laughs> yeah. Who is this? So, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of really enriching experiences to be had when you live sustainably without chemicals uh, and in, in harmony with nature. Here's our friend Oscar the Grass. He would, and, and it's okay to have fun with sustainability. It really is. He would greet visitors near our driveway. And um, here he is after his first haircut. And then his first winter, he was looking a bit forlorn because he was stuck outside. The design strategies we used were common before fossil fuels became cheap and abundant. They have been very useful for us for the last 35 years. When these fuels become scarce and expensive again in the near future, these strategies will become indispensable in maintaining our quality of life and will remain essential for conserving our diminishing resources. Herbert Stein, an economic advisor to President Nixon, once made a very clear statement about finite resources. And he said, whatever can't go on forever, won't. You can choose to start making the transitions now and be prepared for the challenges that are surfacing and, and those that will soon appear 
or you can wait until we have no other choices and try to adapt to a much more powerful combination of crises. If my wife and I have been misled or mistaken about the converging crises that can continue to arrive, the absolute worst, worst that can happen is that we will leave a better world for our grandchildren. If the denialists are wrong and things really are as bad or worse than the great majority of scientific minds are telling us, we will be left not only with a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, or a bad year. We will leave future generations with a bad world and no way out. So the choice is ours today. Now, it's time to get angry and to get active. So what's the answer to where do I start and when? Start right here. Start right now. By taking a pledge that will change the way that you see the world. The Pledge of Allegiance is partly a pledge to an... an, an <laughs> to an inanimate symbol, a flag. The Pledge of Alliance is a pledge to the earth from which we come in a simple first step to true sustainability. The earth is alive, enables our lives, and is where we are quite literally grounded. I may have a little trouble getting through this. She gives us everything we need to survive and thrive if we use those gifts wisely. She is very powerful. And we need her. She does not need us. It is unquestionably in our best interest to become her ally and not to remain the enemy we have become. The Pledge of Alliance is not a pledge of allegiance. It is a pledge of peace to the earth and to our fellow travelers on this planet. Here it is. I pledge alliance to the earth and to the living systems and cycles that give us life. One common direction unchanging, with health and prosperity for all. The common direction is the path to sustainability. Health and prosperity for all species is possible only if we cooperate with and nurture our planet's fragile life support systems. The pledge gives us a forceful common direction and a goal to unite our efforts in creating a sustainable world. It is simple, direct, easy to understand, and concise. We can use it often to remind ourselves of the need to restore, repair, regenerate, respect, and ultimately learn to love the stunningly beautiful jewel in our solar system that we call Earth. Those of you who wish to take the pledge, oops, there it is. Please stand and place your hand over your heart. Ready? I pledge alliance to the earth and to the simple systems and cycles that give us life. One common direction, unchanging, with health and prosperity for all. The process has begun. You have become the leaders we have been waiting for. 
and our ambassadors to the future. Embrace the challenge and have the courage to start conversations that matter. Begin to use all your power to design a future that our children will want to live in. If people try to discourage you or ignore you, remember this Mexican proverb. <laughs> Thanks for coming and share the seeds you got today. Share those seeds with everyone you can and don't get discouraged. It's easy to get discouraged. Time is really short and it's past time for a change for our children. Peace. Check out our website, holdtonature.com. And also, uh, we're going to uh, start a uh, crowdfunding campaign for the book, Homeland Prosperity. And if you're interested in contributing to that, no commitment now. Just put your name and information down, and I'll contact you when, when that goes active.